I would just like to check with our resource persons uh, if you're already there. Can you can you please unmute yourself and check if you can share if you can share screen, Miss Kritika, if you are there, I would like to request you to please uh, check your screen and uh, check whether you can share right. your PowerPoint presentation. I'm here. Yeah, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Sorry, I disconnected for a second. Am I audible? Yes, yes, you are. I can't share screen. It tells me that uh, host has disabled participant host screen. Host has screen. disabled. So you'll have to give me permission. Um, Whoever the host is. Okay, just check again. Okay. Yeah, I can. All right, good. Let's just, can you see this? Just wait a second. Yes, 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 it's okay. visible. All right. All right, thank you. How are you? I'm good, how are you? Fine, it's good to hear your voice. It's almost three. Uh, we will just wait for our participants to join. And uh, maybe after two, three minutes, we will be able to start the program. All right, all right. Okay, since it's uh, three o'clock now, uh, we will start our program uh, so that we will be able to give more time uh, to our resource persons. Uh, a very good afternoon to our respected resource persons and all our participants who are joining us today uh, through Zoom and YouTube Live. Uh, today, on behalf of the Department of English and Women's Cell, Government Sertip College, I once again extend a warm welcome to all on the second day of our three days webinar series on gender and culture. Uh, we started our first day last night with the topic politics of intimacy, LGBT and the MISO, which was well received and highly appreciated from all corners because 
of our exceptional speakers, Dr. Christina Zetzama and Dr. and Dr. Cizo Tanmoya. And we thank them, we truly thank them for the remarkable talk they delivered. And uh, however, on the other hand, we sincerely apologize uh, for the technical glitch we encountered last night. Uh, the fault being partly me since I had to hand over the responsibility of hosting the event at the last minute due to the sudden demise of my grandmother, my earth angel. However, um, as they say, the show must go on and uh, we thank God's guidance for today's program. So uh, we hope that um, our program today runs smoothly. Um, there are no words to convey our respect and our sincere gratitude to um, our resource persons, the ones who had already delivered their talk last night. And uh, uh, the two other resource persons are invited guest, Ms. Dalma Somi and our resource person, Dr. Kritika, uh, I mean, Ms. Kritika Sharma <laughs> um, for taking their time from their busy schedule to be with us today. Um, and also I would like to mention um, our sincere gratitude to our participants as well. Uh, mostly, uh, you know, some of our, many of our participants here today are our students. And uh, some of them are uh, were a little too active last night. <laughs> and so I take this opportunity to ask all the participants to mute yourself. And I would also like to say that, you know, this is an open webinar, which is being broadcasted live on YouTube. So we request your sincere participation. And I would also like to make an announcement uh, to please not leave your phone or your laptop unattended. All right. Uh, so, <laughs> Because if you unmute yourself in the middle of uh, you know, a presentation or our speech, then it gets disturbed. So uh, I request our students to not leave uh, you know, your role number in the chat box. Your attendance will be taken separately. And also to, to, to please stay um, attentive throughout uh, the program. And uh, I would like to request all of you to contribute more questions and views once again uh, through the chat box. Um, it is with great enthusiasm that we present once again two extraordinary personalities. Today, Ms. Kritika Sharma, our speaker, and Ms. Lalma Somi, our invited guest. Uh, to start off with uh, Kritika Sharma, uh, she's an assistant professor in the Department of English, Delhi University at Hindu College, Delhi University. Her MPhil work was on contemporary war poetry and her research interests include uh, literary and critical theory, 20th century literature and women's writing. I would like to mention on a personal note that I have had the privilege of working with her at Hindu College for a good number of around five years, I think. And uh, during those years that we spent together as colleagues and as close friends, I have witnessed her immense dedication in her teaching and her sincere love for literature as well. So she is extremely, extremely well-read, I should say, and uh, is able to shed light on any topic uh, that you throw at her. So, uh, however, one thing is that her humility and uh, her genuine personality is what, you know, uh, will captivate your attention and um, as will her vast knowledge, which I hope will be etched in your memory. I'm sure she will leave us with fresh perspectives and I would sincerely ask the participants uh, to, uh, you know, uh, to um, make use of her insights, um, you know, as she will be giving us lots to ponder on. So without further ado, let me call upon uh, Ms. Kritika Sharma to present her paper, which is titled, What Does It Matter Who Is Speaking? Feminism and Literary Theory. Um, okay, I, I now invite Ms. Kritika uh, to give her talk. Thank you so much. I am sure I did not deserve such a flattering introduction. But, but thank you, and thank you to Government Search College for inviting me. I am going to share my screen, uh, so I think I will just stop my video until then. I'll okay. uh, switch it back on once we are taking questions. It's all right, Kritika, you can, you can still turn on your video and share all the right. screen. Yeah. Okay, all right. Can you just confirm if you can see this? Yes, yes, yes. Right. Thank you. Let me just start with a few disclaimers first. Uh, this is since this is a very general topic, feminism and literary theory, uh, I obviously cannot, uh, I have to be very selective, which I have been. 
So what I will not be getting into in this paper are various definitions of feminism. I will just take it for granted that all feminist theory, even when they don't agree on everything, feminist theories, I should say, even when they don't agree on everything, they have a few tenets in common. They all believe that feminism is uh, a demand for equal rights for women and men. So we are, uh, we are not going to get into a debate about feminism versus humanism versus equalism, which is very popular in, 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 in culture today. So uh, popular culture today, that is not something that I will get into. It is also not going to be a very bibliographic look at feminism or feminist theory, because that is impossible for me to do uh, in a very in a very brief PowerPoint presentation. So I will not be. It's, it, it's I'm only going to refer to a very few selective texts that I think make important points that we that can serve us as beginners in feminist literary theory, which is also my third disclaimer. This is a, a not a lot of it is going to be new for a lot of you. This is a very basic introductory uh, entrance into feminism and literary theory. Having said that, let me just quickly spend two minutes on the title as well. What does it matter who is speaking? Uh, the, it's a famous quote by uh, Samuel Beckett, the Irish playwright. Uh, and I have taken this only because uh, Michel Foucault begins his essay, What is an Author, with this line. I will I'll get into this, I'll get into this question of authorship in the next slide. But I also quickly want to say that this paper is going to be focused on feminist theory that emerges in the 60s, 70s, 80s, in the in this sort of a very particular social, philosophical, political climate of the 1960s. It is a direct product of that. So I will not, I will refer to a few predecessors of feminist theory. But again, for the lack of time and space, I won't be able to get into them. Let me also, one last thing, let me also quickly get into uh, just alerting you to the fact that literary theory and literary criticism are not necessarily the same thing. Again, this is something you, you know, uh, most of our university syllabi, and I'm sure that's true for Mizoram University as well, uh, have separate papers titled literary criticism and literary theory. Literary theory is, uh, or various literary theories, that's the better term, emerge in around the 1960s and 70s after the Second World War as a, as a demand for literature or other cultural objects to also be read in particular ways. Literary criticism, let us just think of it as literary theory in practice. So when I, when I use feminist criticism or feminist theory, I will pretty much be using them synonymously. But since I'm referring to the 1960s, 70s, or at least the post 1960s climate, I, uh, I, I hope that you will keep in mind that I mean feminist theory in practice. Okay. All right, so what does it matter who is speaking? Foucault begins his essay, what is an author with this line? And he's essentially asking a question that had become a very hot topic of debate in the 1960s, the idea of authorship. When we read literature and all of us as students and teachers of literature have to have, have we've had this conflict, where does, the, where does the meaning of a text lie? Does the meaning come from the author? Does the author decide what a text would mean? As if that is true, what are the limits of that? Uh, do we do we follow the author's intention? Do we all, do we follow what the author tells us the he or she means by the text? I'll give you a quick example of the problem here. Uh, we are all familiar with John Milton's Paradise Lost. Excuse me. We are all familiar with John Milton's Paradise Lost, in which he in which he famously presented Satan as a rebel. He meant for Satan to be presented as a villain, as the antagonist of the story of Adam and Eve. But for the Romantics in the 19th century, Satan becomes the unspoken hero. So they say that famously Blake said that Milton is of the devil's party without knowing it. And, and that also is a problem, is the problem with authorship. If Milton decides what Satan is or what he 
uh, or, or that the way he has presented Satan in the text is the definitive way, then we cannot make a reading like that. We cannot say that Satan is the hero of Paradise Lost. But that is, but but fortunately or unfortunately, the meaning of a text does not lie only with the author. Then where else does it lie? Does it lie with the reader? Does that mean that anything that the reader decides about a text, that is the meaning? Two readers will not read the same text in the same way. Again, think about uh, a Protestant reading Paradise Lost in the 17th century and the Romantics reading Paradise Lost in the 19th century. They are not reading Paradise Lost in the same way. Then does it the meaning lie in the text itself? But then how to interpret it? And how is interpretation possible without the author or without the reader? And it's, and it's among this, um, within this debate in the 1960s, that this question about authorship arises. So a lot of you would be familiar with Barthes' essay, The Death of the Author, in which he essentially claims that the author is not the sole bearer of meaning. The meaning of a text does not reside with the author. The author does not decide what the text means. Neither does the author's biography, author's intentions. Barth famously ends his essay with saying that the death of the author leads to the birth of the reader. Foucault and Barth, these are two essays that I would highly recommend. They're not saying the same thing, but they are making some similar assumptions. They are both saying that the author does not decide where the, text uh, where the meaning of a text lies. Therefore, the actual author of a text sort of stops mattering, ceases to matter. It doesn't matter if it's a man or a woman. It doesn't matter if it's a uh, it's an American or an Indian. It doesn't matter if it's if he's somebody who's writing in the 1950s or somebody who's writing in the 1450s. However, I hope you can see the problem with this, right? To say that the author's identity does not matter, to say that the reader's identity does not matter, is also, excuse me, is also is also to sort of say that. The text, the text sort of the text exists independent of context. And all of us as readers and writers, especially in a post-colonial context, especially, especially in um, especially in India, reading syllabi that are heavy with Western literature. I again I think that's that's going to be true for Mizoram University. It's definitely true for Delhi University. Our English honors syllabi are dominated by British literature or American literature, but definitely Western literature. Do we then read an American text in the same way that an American reader would? Do we read a British text in the same way that a British reader would? Does it not matter that I'm in Delhi or you're in Mizoram or does your ethnicity, gender, class not matter when reading a text? And it's in answer to these, it's an answer to this entire idea that the author doesn't matter, the, the death of the author, that a number of schools of literary theory emerge in the 1960s that take identities as points of departure. So I will use race as a point of departure to read literary texts. A lot of African-American theory, African-American criticism does that gender, which we will be getting into. Feminist criticism takes gender as a point of departure. You have Dalit studies, caste as a point of departure. Class, Marxism takes class as a point of departure. Colonization, post-colonial literatures, post-colonial theory takes your colonized status as a point of departure. Sexual orientation, queer theory takes sexual orientation slash gender. That's also something we'll be getting into as points of departure. So there's notice the debate here, the debate between identity does not matter and identity becomes the way we read or write a text. I will quote this slightly longish paragraph from Liz Stanley uh, from her book, The Autobiographical Eye, which is itself an example of feminist criticism. It's a feminist uh, criticism of, I think three or four autobiographies by female authors. But she is addressing this debate about the death of the author. Consider what the denial of authorship actually does to say that authorship doesn't matter. You read the text in its own, as itself. You don't worry about the context. It removes from existence as worth commenting upon, indeed as something which it is authorized to comment upon, 
the fact that this argument that the, that the author is dead is articulated by a few white middle class male first world elite self styled intellectuals, a very convenient death for them. As she goes on, at the very point when, due to the activities of anti colonialism, the black movement, the women's movements, again, so 1960s, the women's movement, the gay movement, the author is named and has an accusatory finger pointed at him. The author at this point conveniently dies. This is a suicide that is no suicide at all. This, this suicide is alive and well and still calling the theoretical shots. And I think Stanley makes a very important point. Uh, she's, she is pointing out that only people who have the most mainstream culturally dominant identities cite the death of the, the, death of the author, cite that identity does not matter. No feminist theorist would say that. No post-colonial theorist would say that. No Dalit theorist would say that. No gay theorist would say that. Or queer theorist would say that. Uh, it's at exactly at this point when all of these movements are emerging and all of these movements are pointing the finger at the male, white male heterosexual author. It's at this point that they declare that it doesn't matter. Identity doesn't matter. So it's important to put feminist theory, feminist criticism in, in the set of identity-based theory, identity-based criticism. And that is not to, and that is not to denigrate it. That is not to say that it is somehow not universal or what it says will not speak to most identities. But it's important to point out that your position as a man or a woman or whatever gender you identify as, identify as doesn't matter when you read or write a text. That is blatantly untrue. And I think Stanley does a good job uh, to point that out. So when we say, what does it matter who is speaking? Beckett meant it sarcastically. Beckett, Beckett was interested in language in itself. He himself, of course, was a Western white uh, elite intellectual. But <clears throat> Foucault uses it in a similar, similar way. It doesn't actually matter who is speaking, he says as long as the, the voice, as it, what matters is the discourse, that's, that's Foucault. But feminist theory, of course, answers that question as, yes, of course it matters who is speaking, especially when who is speaking is a minority, or especially when who is speaking is somebody who has been historically oppressed, women, uh, African-Americans, queer people, Dalits, etc., colonized people. Let me then get into feminist literary theory now that I have put it in the context of identity criticism or identity theory, identity based theories. I want to quickly give a shout out to three ancestors of feminist literary theory. Obviously, these are not women writing in the 1960s, but their work has heavily influenced the authors who are Mary Wollstonecraft, Simone de Beauvoir, Virginia Woolf. Mary Wollstonecraft writes in the 18th century, the end of the 18th century, a book called The Vindication for the Rights of Women, in which he, in which he, without using the word feminism, in fact, without even saying that men and women are equal, that's not a that's not really an argument she could make in the 18th century. She's she criticizes cultural objects and literary texts and cultural practices from a feminine point of view, from a female point of view. The word feminism did not exist then, but Wollstonecraft is often seen as a proto-feminist, as a beginner of this movement. Simone de Beauvoir in the 1940s, France, wrote this famous book called The Second Sex, in which she does a similar thing. She uses the word feminism, identifies as a feminist, says that famous line, one is not born, but becomes a woman that femininity, womanhood, is not natural, it is not essential, it is not something you are born as, it is something that you become. It is something that you become based on your social and cultural position. So giving a nod to them, the one I do want to quickly go into in a little bit more detail is Virginia Woolf. Her famous book, A Room of One's Own, which is probably the beginning, beginning of feminist literary criticism a book that heavily influences feminist theory. And more than that is just a beautifully written book. So another book that I would highly recommend if you haven't already read it, you should. 
but it's it's highly influential for feminist theorists. It it makes a few important points, like it links literature with life. It says this is a book written in 1928, by the way, so way before all of these debates about authorship. But she links literature with life. She says literature cannot exist by itself. It cannot exist in its own world. It is even if it is very tenuously connected, it is connected to life. She talks about the significance of material conditions of authors. That's why, by the way, she calls the book a room of one's own. The question that she's dealing with is how will it be possible for a woman to become a poet, for a woman to become a uh, to, to earn money through poetry, for a, for a woman to become a successful poet. And she says for a woman to do that, she needs two things, a room of her own, so space essentially, and 500 pounds a year, money, material things. We, we, have, this, we have this sense that authors are geniuses who, who do not seem to exist on worldly things. They don't need food or water or they don't need to pay rent to sustain themselves. And in 1928, Virginia Woolf is pointing out that that is not true. Authors, especially female authors, uh, are matters of, are products of functions of their material conditions. It matters how they earn money. It matters where they get their food. To, to, to be able to write, you also need a certain amount of leisure. You need space and money. She highlights the link between women's creativity and social and economic systems. The fact that creativity is not something that sort of exists out of nothing. Creativity, she famously, has, she famously says in this book that genius like Shakespeare must have been born among the working classes and women as well, right? It's just that we don't, they don't get to realize their potential because they, have, they are busy earning money to make ends meet, to, to, to eat food and to pay rent. So she creates this link, she highlights this link between women's creativity and social and economic systems. They are not free of each other. Social and economic systems, uh, your creativity, your authorship depends on social and economic systems. And very importantly, she points out the lack of a female literary tradition. Where are, my, where are our grandmothers, she asks, where are our, where are our ancestors? Where, are, uh, where is the canon of women writing literature? Which again, which is something that modern syllabi have tried to remedy. So we do have separate papers titled women's writing. Though think about why we need separate papers titled women's writing, which takes you back to those, the discussion about authorship and identity. But we do have a sense of a female tradition now, but not in 1928, not when Virginia Woolf is writing this. So what does feminist theory believe or feminist literary theory? Uh, again, feminist literary theory would be feminist theory applied to literature, right? So we're not talking about feminist theory in let's say sociology, political science, philosophy. Though of course, all students of literature know that all of these disciplines are ours as well, right? In English, we, we are free to refer to all of them and we are free to use all of them which is again a unique freedom that English literature provides us. But what, what are a few common tenets of feminist theory? One, women's inequality is not natural but constructed, obvious point. Women's inequality is not a condition of, is not essential. It's not a condition of birth. It's not that women are naturally unequal. They have been made unequal. They have been made unequal by social, political, cultural, economic forces. And this is historical. This begins, in, in, biblically, this begins when, when, with the sin of Eve, with the original sin, which leads to the belief that women need to be controlled, otherwise they run rampant. That male cultural dominance is dependent on the control of female sexuality. Uh, it, excuse me, uh, female sexuality essentially quarreled through, essentially controlled through marriage, the, question, the idea of reproduction, the idea of uh, the, the, this whole cultural trend in which we have created certain women into 
so certain women into a well i'll make that point i'll we'll read that in the next point but into bad women or loose women because they are sexually promiscuous because it's through the control of female sexuality that male dominance perpetuates itself uh, through the ideas of inheritance chastity right which are all connected the question of representation is an important question who represents and how and in what ways dominance is established through certain cultural representations literature and i will invite you to think about cinema to think about tv to think about all of these cultural objects not just books and novels they construct women as either virgins or whores to reinforce the values of patriarchal society the good women are rewarded in marriage the bad women are punished through death and confinement and a very good example of this would be charlotte bronte's jane eyre right in which there is a very clear conflict between jane and bertha mason jane who is yes she is outspoken but she is ultimately submissive she is ultimately the good woman she is the moral woman and bertha mason who's importantly also not white but she is also presented as sexually promiscuous an alcoholic mad and therefore one at the end of the novel will be punished by marriage and the other one will be punished by death and throughout the novel will be punished by confinement which will end in death and this is a very typical kind of representation of women female characters in the 19th century think about how good women and bad women or women are labeled as good or bad or a pure or loose in 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 our everyday interactions as well then the difficulty of coming to terms with not having a language of one's own i will very uh, this is an entire area in feminist theory that we call phallocentrism the idea phallocentrism the idea that language is male authored male generated male dominated think about for example uh, the fact that now it has begun to change but for so long the universal pronoun was he right even today most of us it's he that rolls easily off the tongue when i am talking about uh, an imaginary uh, in an imaginary example it it's the pronoun he that rolls off the tongue easily think about how mankind would would be the universal marker something that simone de beauvoir points out mankind refers to everyone but woman kind refers to women alone so this ties in with the fact that language so far in uh, in the history of english literature has been dominated by men written by men produced by men and easily used by men so uh, this becomes a concern in a lot of feminist theory the fact that we that women don't have a language of their own so some french feminists will talk about the ecriture feminine or women writing and that the fact that women don't write let's say english or french as men do but they write with their whole bodies which is another theoretical area altogether but in a room of one's own wolf calls this the man's sentence the fact that all women have to work with is the man's sentence so women will either write like men or they will write against men or opposite to the way that men write but in either case they are defined by the man's sentence how men write reading as well as writing this the we talked about in the authorship point reading as well as writing are not neutral not but they are highly fraught acts you cannot there is no reading that is not subjective there is no reading that is not neutral however much you say that you are being objective or you are being neutral it is impossible given who you are given your identities if they are highly fraught acts reading is a site for social change that's something that feminist theory most identity based theories will say that right that it matters how you read a text so now many years ago salman rushdi got into a lot of trouble for for saying in an article that he can just read one paragraph of any text and he can guess and guess correctly whether it has been written by a man or a woman and then a lot of uh, websites came out with quizzes asking you to do that you can still go and try and do that and see if you can guess 
but uh, but he wasn't wrong right there's a very there are remarkable differences not always of course there are exceptions but but in the mid 20th century women and men write quite differently but more importantly more important to us right now they read differently as well right a man cannot read as a woman given who he is a woman cannot read as a man given who she is however much we say we are being neutral objective we aren't and and that is transformative that's a political act reading as who you are reading based on context is uh, it can be a site for social change social criticism there is a lot of concern with conditioning and socialization uh, again the idea that femininity is something that is socialized con con constructed conditioned women as well as men are conditioned into behaving in certain ways i will quickly point you to this uh, very handy distinction that toril moy another feminist critic makes between these three terms feminist female and feminine feminist is a political position she says female is a matter of biology and feminine a set of culturally defined characteristics and of course not all interchangeable so this is what they believe but what does feminist literary theory do how do you do theory which in itself is a slightly contradictory question because we often do not associate theory with praxis we don't associate theory with doing but of course theory does something the reading itself is an act right concerned with the place of women writers in literary history so what they do is they recover women's literature they come up with canons of women's writing whatever women's writing papers you have in your syllabi are all thanks to intervention by feminist critics and feminist theories theorists though they they spend and we'll I'll give you another example later but there's a lot of concern with ancestry uh alice walker who i think you also read Uh, wrote this famous essay called "In Search of Our Mother's Gardens," and that is the idea that she's ex she's expressing there as well. Where are our mothers and our foremothers? Where are our ancestors? And women writing, women's writing has generally been erased from literary history, but that is something that feminist theory is trying to recover through acts of reading and writing. Feminist theory highlights gendered politics. and power relations within texts right it's not just to say that you know patriarchy exists patriarchy is bad but to point out how gender affects behavior beha affects a uh, situation affects context for all uh, for all beings men women whatever gender you identify as and what are the politics of gender and what are the power relations within texts that's something that feminist theory is concerned with rewrites a literary canon this this is the this is connected to the first point dominated by generations of male writers and critics right you think of english literature you'll begin with chaucer chaucer and milton shakespeare chaucer shakespeare milton uh, there's a lord uh, dickens lawrence there's a very clear trajectory but not true for female writers challenges aesthetic and conceptual criteria by which women writers and artists were or are judged of course they were in the 19th century a lot of women authors wrote with pseudonyms so they gave themselves male names or they wrote anonymously charlotte bronte in her preface to jane eyre uh, mentions this she says that she wrote under a pseudonym under the name carrer bell because she was trying to avoid two things undue criticism that she would get as a female author um, she is a woman how can she write well and undue praise she is writing well for a woman right even though she is a woman she is writing well and that's exactly the kind of criticism both good and bad that she was trying to avoid and we still have these uh, stereotypes in mind even today in popular culture it we it, it makes a difference whether a book is written by or a movie is directed by a woman or a man feminist literary theory analyzes the gaze the just the act of looking which itself is a political act there's a lot of power involved in who looks 
who are you looking at looking is also a kind of judging looking is a kind of so again think about this right now only my video is on all of you are looking at me i cannot see you i am in your power and right? you are looking at me judging me making up your minds about me even that that very innocent act of looking is an act of power relations whose perspective are we presented with who is doing the looking the power held by those who look compared to those who are looked upon looking itself like i said a political act i will come to the point of the gaze for 2 minutes quickly uh, let me just uh, finish reading the last point it they reappraise literary theory reappraises neutral critical evaluations and notions of literary value so not just writing or reading that literary criticism can be neutral and the idea that we have certain criteria that we think should be valued in literature this kind of writing this kind of theme so a, a text about a text about philosophy and death so dostoevsky or tolstoy will be considered geniuses right off the bat but a text about uh, the kitchen a domestic text a text about shopping right they will these are not these are not concerns that we value in society because we consider them feminine gossip right texts jane austen gets this criticism a lot that her her text her literature is mostly got uh, gossip let me quickly talk about the male gaze i uh, will read this quote from john burgess book ways of seeing which is also where i've taken this painting from which is a good example of the male gaze it's a painting called uh, reclining bacante in which bacante this uh, the woman she is of course looking at you the spectator completely exposed to to your view while i hope you can see uh, this man in the right hand upper right hand corner who's looking at her right and so and essentially two people are looking at her in, in, in this painting <coughs> him the man and you the spectator burger says something very interesting about the the idea of the gaze in men and women he says one might simplify this by saying men act and women appear just excuse me ha men look at women women watch themselves being looked at even when women are looking at themselves he says even in a mirror let's say they are looking at how men will look at them so women even looking at themselves do not occupy the powerful position politically this determines not only most relations between men and women but also the relation of women to themselves the surveyor of women in, in herself is male and that i think is a very interesting point that he's making slightly dated this is a book from 1972 but he's saying that women looking at themselves also look at themselves through the male gaze <coughs> the surveyed female thus she turns herself into an object and most particularly an object of vision a sight something to be looked at let me also uh, give me leave to give you a quick example most of you are probably familiar with pride and prejudice uh, if you've not read the book you've probably seen the movie but in the book there's this very interesting scene where uh, elizabeth has started changing her mind about mr darcy and now she is come to pemberley and she is looking at how rich and beautiful pemberley is and in one of the rooms of pemberley she is shown a portrait gallery where there are portraits of mr darcy and his family and in that scene she looks mr darcy is not even there he is not on the scene she looks at a picture of mr darcy and in the text it says that she she looks at him and he seems in the painting as if he is looking at her and i think that's a very good example of what burger is saying here even in that scene where she is looking at a picture of mr darcy she imagines him looking at her and looking in itself like i said is an act that 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 creates power relations and often the gaze that women are looked at 
even when it's other women looking at them. So when we, let's say when we look at ourselves and say things like, I'm not like other girls, or when we look at other women and judge them based on appearance, based on, uh, based on weight, based on uh, character, we are often making appraisals that, that, that could be called patriarchal. I will, again, this is not something I'll go into in a lot of detail, but a quick primer on a few other authors and some important points that they make. Uh, again, like I said, all of this is dated. This is all 60s, 70s, 80s. Um, and feminist literary theory has gone quite beyond that. But uh, that's outside of my scope right now. Kate Millett in her famous book, Sexual Politics, reassesses negative depictions of female characters in works of canonical male authors, authors like Dickens, Lawrence, uh, Conrad, etc. And then she argues that literary quality must not and cannot be considered outside issues of political responsibility. The famous debate we still have today, art versus the artist. If, if somebody's art is beautiful, writing is beautiful, does it matter that they are misogynistic or racist or casteist or bigots, right? She is obviously arguing that it does. She's saying that we cannot divorce uh, quality from responsibility. We cannot divorce an author's style, an author's genius from their political responsibility. Elaine Schalter in a literature of their own, and she, she probably did the most to recover a literary canon establishes a tradition of women's writing beyond the big five, beyond Jane Austen, Charlotte Bronte, Emily Bronte, George Eliot, and Virginia Woolf. These are, the, these are the female authors that you will study in your syllabi as well. She reads hundreds of other authors from the 18th century to the 20th century who have just been, female authors who have just been forgotten, who, have, who find no place in literary history. And she's trying to give them a place in literary history. Laura Mulvey in her essay, Visual Pleasure in Narrative Cinema, again talks about the male gaze. And she makes this interesting comparison between the camera and the male gaze. She essentially says that the camera becomes the substitute for the gaze, and it's more often than not masculine. Audrey Lord, Women Redefining Difference, which I will again come into briefly in the next slide. I also quickly want to point out, again, I'm really sorry for the haphazardness of this paper, but like I said, it's supposed to be a general introduction. Debate between Anglo-American and French feminist theory. And interestingly, this debate mostly revolves around how much theory should we put in our criticism. When I'm reading a literary text, and I'm sure as liter literature teachers and students, we all have this as well, that we are forgetting the text and we are doing too much theory or we are not doing enough theory. So that's kind of the debate where Anglo-American literary theory mostly focuses on, uh, so people like Millet and Schalter focuses on questions of style, questions of theme, questions of representation. While French feminist theory, which I will not get into, Lucy de Grey, Helen, Sisu, they are mostly concerned with uh, cultural issues. They are concerned with writing theory and not textual criticism. So that's a very interesting debate. Intersectionality, um, th this is coming from this debate. Note that even within feminist theory, who, and they have some, obviously they have some beliefs in common. I listed those beliefs, but even within feminist theory, there is so much conflict. There is so much debate about how to do feminist theory. And that competitiveness extends to other identity markers. So again, when, you, when I ask who you are, right? You will never identify yourselves based on one thing. You will not only say, I'm a girl or I'm a boy. You will also, you'll also say where you're from, where you study, uh, what perhaps what religion you belong to, caste, color, ethnicity, race. And that's, a, that's an important concern. And also an old debate. And also, if I can say, a yet unresolved debate. Even Virginia Woolf, in a room of one's own, asks this question. She doesn't put it in those words, but she's concerned with the question of 
which is more important which is the which is more fundamental to me my gender or my class and she says famously in the book that if she had a choice between the right to vote which is what women were asking for at that time and the right for money right to own money she would choose money she would kind of choose class over gender and she she implies implies that she implies that uh, it's redistribution of money that will that will help with gender relations as well not vice versa so this debate between marxism and feminism where marxism will say that class is more fundamental and feminism would say that gender is more fundamental she doesn't give you a direct answer but she kind of says class but that's that's still a debate that's a debate that is still going on what is the underlying determinant of identity and consciousness what is my most fundamental identity what what is my subjectivity based on my gender my class my race my colonial status my sexual orientation and at different times you will answer differently and different theories answer them differently so this is a debate within feminism as well we kind of resolve it as intersectionality that of course our identities are intersections of various identities audrey lord in the essay i had named in the previous slide sorry says there is a pretense to homogeneity of experience covered by the word sisterhood that does not in fact exist but there is no universal feminism what is feminist for a white woman is not necessarily feminist for a black woman toni morrison in the preface to her novel beloved no it's actually in an interview about the novel beloved she talks about that she talks about how at the time in the 60s and 70s when women were fighting for the right for right to abortion uh, the right to have children became the most most freedom for black women so their their demands are sort of in conflict with each other and there's a there's just a nice little cartoon here for you to see again the idea that uh, we we can answer the charge of equalism or humanism but then within look at the the second panel why do you need black feminism it should just be feminism why would you divide this like that right the idea that of course within feminism one needs uh, intersectionality and that happens through admitting that different groups will have different demands and different concerns so you can have black feminism and lesbian feminism feminism and radical feminism and dalit feminism queer feminism etc okay i'll end with this the quickly this was mostly uh, a lot of the debates that were happening in the 60s and 70s starting in the 80s and uh, sort of peaked in the 1990s goes on even until now a lot of these questions of feminism came to a head a lot of these questions that fem- debates within feminism uh they they sort of uh, there was no way beyond them the idea that even when i am even when i am pointing out even when i am doing feminist criticism i can often fall into essentialist views of men and women so i will just say that yeah women are more intu- uh, more intuitive women are women are more uh, caring more nurturing but that's a good thing it's just that we are we have we are taking the same qualities that men say women have and we are making them positive a lot of feminist criticism fell into that trap but it's in the 80s and 90s there's a way beyond feminist criticism or feminist theory that we can call gender theory or queer theory keep in mind they're not opposites of they they're not against feminist theory in fact they emerge out of feminist theory but gender theory essentially will foreground gender and not feminism right it it will foreground the idea that gender itself is a site of struggle not male gender female gender just just the concept of gender as well uh, of course the pioneers of gender theory and queer theory is one of the pioneers is judith butler who sort of famously says that there is no such thing as a woman but she essentially means that there is nothing essential about a woman so you cannot say that a woman is uh no a woman is always intuitive and nurturing 
and give her all of those positive aspects. The, the fact that the idea of a woman is a construct, right? And of course, that leads to a lot of debate between the material conditions or reality of women. Of course, women exist, right? Some of us identify as women. We have, there are so many policies in the world that impact us as women. And the implications of Butler's idea that there is no such thing as a woman, implications of Butler's idea that gender is somehow a construct. Uh, obviously, this is not a question that we can resolve right now in two minutes, but to, to just keep in mind uh, the fact that just because something is a uh, construct doesn't mean that it, it is not real, that it doesn't exist, and that it doesn't have political implications. And it's exactly these questions, it's exactly this debate that gender theory is trying to answer. So that is perhaps another discussion. That is perhaps another paper. I will end right now. Like I said, this was supposed to be only a very brief introductory primer to feminist theory. Thank you. And if you have any questions, suggestions, comments, I'll be happy to take them. Okay. Thank you so much, Ms. Kritika Sharma, for enlightening us on a topic that is truly, truly relevant and beneficial for us as students of literature and as teachers of literature as well. Um, we thank you for making your ideas simple and easy to grasp, uh, yet making us rethink and re-examine our views and ideas on feminist theory and uh, politics. Uh, now, uh, to further boost our thinking on the topic and uh, initiate the discussion, I would like to call upon uh, Ms. Lelma Somi, Assistant Professor from the Department of English um, at Patsunga University College. Um, I would like to also uh, start with a very uh, brief introduction. Uh, Ms. Lelma Somi, or Ms. Nuboi, as she is fondly called, uh, have worked um, at PUC for 17 years. I too was once her student and uh, today I feel immense pride to have had the opportunity uh, you know, to sit in her class. And uh, I would also like to mention that uh, she was one of the few teachers uh, who could command a class you know, through her imposing figure and her personality. And yeah, for me that was there, but uh, it was more of her vast knowledge and her zeal in teaching. Um, you know, that stayed with me and made me uh, a fan till today. Uh, and uh, I would like to mention that her area of research uh, today is on mesocultural studies and she is currently pursuing PhD in the politics of identity in select works of James Do Puma. Uh, her area of interest also includes Northeast writings in English and post-colonialism. Uh, so we are truly grateful uh, for her presence today and we are looking forward to a lively discussion session under her guidance. Um, okay, another important announcement that I would like to make, uh, I'm sure they will, be, they will be able to hear me. I would like to announce that, you know, today we are graced by uh, Dr. Krishna Zedzama, a former speaker, and uh, Dr. Sangha, who will also be joining us uh, as an invited guest um, in the next session, that is tomorrow. Uh, I know they would not want me to make a formal, uh, you know, um, uh, or I would, I, I know they would not want me to be too formal about this in thanking them, but uh, I would like to take this opportunity to invite them, uh, you know, to contribute their ideas, their insights on feminism, and also join us in the discussion session. So without further ado, I would like to call upon Ms. Nuboi uh, to share a dialogue with uh, uh, Ms. Kritika uh, or to ask questions, uh, you know, to initiate the discussion uh, in a more simple way, uh, whichever way she wants to approach it. Um, in the meantime, uh, questions are also invited for, from uh, the participants. So let me now call upon Ms. Nuboi. Thank you, Dr. Rinsani, uh, for inviting me and also for that introduction, which I feel I do not really, really deserve. Now, I've had, uh, like she has said, I've had the pleasure of working with her as she was one of the brightest students we've ever had. And also, I've had the pleasure of working with her as a colleague later on in our college before she joined this call, uh, Sirsip College. And I'm really honored to be invited by her to this program. Now, uh, uh, to uh, Ms. Kritika also, I would like to comment her on being able to uh, explain the 
theoretical aspects of feminism in such simple and clear terms. I know it's very hard to explain these things uh, uh, in, in simple terms. In fact, um, I think her experience as a teacher is showing there. Uh, and I think it's really, really important that we bring down uh, 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 theories to the level of the students. Uh, there's a wide gap between the academia and uh, the public, also the, uh, between the academia and the lower uh, classes of uh, learning. So uh, these are things that concern all of us. But then sometimes it can be very, very, it can seem like something that is totally not related to us because of all the jargon that is used. And uh, although it is really very relevant and it should be propagated, however, there, uh, there has been this gap. So I think we're trying to bridge the gap here and I'll try to do the same here also. Uh, now, uh, I thought I would just uh, try to initiate the discussion uh, and bring up some points regarding why feminism in the museum context, that is why we need it. And uh, uh, some of us may think that, okay, this is a given, uh, this is what everybody knows. No, actually, uh, many of our students, uh, I think uh, most of the audience are our students. Uh, I think many of our students uh, really uh, don't know exactly what feminism is yet. Uh, therefore, uh, I will just try to take over from what uh, Ms. Kritika has said and try to explain it in meso, uh, meso context, why we need it and what it is and what it is not, which is equally important. Uh, try to correct a few misconceptions rather than reiterate the theoretical aspects that uh, Ms. Kritika already covered, all right. So uh, now first, let me try to take up the topic of the good girl, bad girl cl classification that Ms. Kritika has mentioned. Now, uh, see this Madonna whore dichotomy, uh, this, uh, it describes the belief that being nurturing and being sexual are mutually exclusive things, that they cannot go together. Uh, for our students, again, let me explain it like this, Madonna representing the image of purity, virginity, the nurturing mother, and the whore representing uh, a prostitute or uh, let's say, uh, it represents sexuality in a negative way, although sexuality in itself is nothing, uh, there's nothing negative about it, right? It's a part, it's a very natural part of life, but it has been uh, portrayed in such a negative way. So here's a question that is usually, uh, here's an, a question that is usually used as an example to explain this Madonna uh, whore dichotomy in the Western world. Now, why is it okay for some people, like both men and women, to view sexualized women with revealing cleavages in sexualized commercials, yet when it comes to breastfeeding in public, they are repulsed. Now, after all, it is the same breast, right? It comes from the same woman. Now, I remember how years ago, that is uh, during uh, Maradona's football days, there was the picture of uh, Maradona's then girlfriend uh, breastfeeding in the stadium and it drew a lot of reactions uh, of course uh, there were some positive outcomes there because there were a lot of people who defended uh, the act itself because uh, in the western world uh, unlike us breastfeeding is something that happens but something that is not done in the public right so uh, I don't remember exactly but uh, what I remember is there were so many reactions. A lot of people were repulsed. Now, in the US, they have laws that allow women to breast public. Now they need laws to allow them. The fact that they even need laws to allow them shows uh, how they view breastfeeding itself. Now, uh, I think it says a lot about their attitude towards what, what is very natural. Now, babies get hungry. They need to uh, get fed, right? But then it should not be done in public. And there have been so many instances where uh, women who are nursing in public are asked to cover up or to be a little bit more discreet. So uh, these there have been instances like that, but in our society, it may not be that that much. We may not get as repulsed as they, uh, they get, but uh, I will use another example here for our society. Like uh, we have this tendency to classify girls and women into girlfriend material and wife material, for example. Uh, so uh, we need to 
question these very assumptions about girls, all right, or women. Let us also question the double standards regarding virginity itself. I have heard so many men saying that they would want to marry a virgin for a wife, but they never question themselves about their own virginity. So there's this double standard. And uh, why should it apply only to women? Now, only when we start questioning our assumptions, when we start to see how the patriarchal ideologies are so deeply entrenched in all of us. Now, this does not apply only to men. It applies to women also. Uh, and coming back to the Badona whore dichotomy again, in a study published in Psychology of Women Quarterly, what they have found is that with the men in the US who endorse the Madonna whore dichotomy, it negatively correlates with their sexual satisfaction in romantic relationships, which in turn predicted lower general relationship satisfaction. Now, uh, I need to mention this because uh, I have not done any research in this field myself, but what I have seen around me is that many men, they tend to marry someone who conform to the ideal woman image, all right? The wife material, the good girl, who they regard as the perfect wife material, but go about having extramarital affairs with women they regard as the girlfriend material or the fling material. Uh, now, there are so many things we can say about this situation. First of all, like how families are broken up in this way. And also, there can be so many things uh, regarding what actually happens after that. But also, we need to ask about, like, uh, what about the wife? Is the husband not able to see her as a sexual partner because she, she has already been seen as the ideal woman who doesn't have any sexual desire of her own, that she is supposed to be the, uh, the good girl, the, the wife who has children, who, prov uh, who takes care of the family, who nurtures. Now, is it that hard to see her in a sexual way for the husband, right? Uh, and also, has the wife repressed her sexuality because of the social conditioning, again? that she is not supposed to express her own sex, uh, sexuality. So there are, the questions can be endless, right? Uh, I'm just pointing out a few of these things just to uh, uh, keep the, uh, the discussion going. Now let's talk uh, about the term with Hoy also. For Kritika, you may not uh, know this, but for our Mizu audience, I, th I don't think the term with Hoy has, uh, it needs any explanation. Now for uh, those not speaking Mizu, the term actually usually applies to a divorced woman or a woman who has had a child out of wedlock and sometimes even to women who has lost their husbands. All right, so we have this term nuthoi. Now, uh, the thing is that nuthoi is assumed to be more available sexually, just assumed to be uh, in that way. And she gets advances from men who presume her to be easy, all right? And she is also the butt of so many jokes. And also, we need to think about uh, the case of what we call the nula senior women, uh, women who have not married after a certain age, uh, which is regarded as the marriageable age. All right. So we have the nula senior, the spinster, you, you would call them. Now they have to endure so much, like private questions, very private questions, and they have become the butts of so many jokes. So many jokes are made at their expense. And people, like uh, even in public places, people will just ask them very private questions, like why haven't they gotten married yet? It's about time they get married, that they should get married as if they, have, they, they are the ones who can decide, right? So we have all these uh, issues about our society. So there is the need for feminism. Like we, we, need, to add, uh, we need to look at the base uh, behind those assumptions, why are we feeling this way? Why are we looking at them in this way? Why do we treat them in this way? So the reason I'm bringing all these up is just to show uh, how relevant the feminist cause is, all right? So you see, there are so, uh, there are so many misconceptions regarding feminism. At, uh, uh, earlier, I used to call myself an equalist, not a, a feminist. Okay, I will not take too much time, but I'm just bringing up here uh, 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 some of the misconceptions from a men's magazine. Okay, take note, a men's magazine. Uh, misconceptions about feminism. All right, so the first one is feminism is essentially about male bashing. Again, these misconceptions are very prevalent here. So that's why I used to call myself uh, 
an equalist rather than a feminist because not because I did not believe in the feminist cause, but rather because of all the misconceptions surrounding the term feminism itself. So, uh, and there's another misconception that only women can be feminists. Now, anyone who believes in the equality of all the sexes or all the genders is a feminist. All right, a feminist is basically someone who believes in feminist uh, uh, equality, right? So there's also another misconception that feminism is detrimental to men, and this applies especially to our Mizo society. That uh, they uh, men tend to think that feminists are shaking the very foundations of uh, uh, Mizo society. All right, and uh, there is also that uh, it is uh, a misconception that feminism is a fight for power and matriarchy. Again, if there is matriarchy, then the, the power has just shifted, right? Like you have said, uh, uh, the power has just shifted. And that another one, feminists are a stuck up crazy and a touchy bunch, all right? <laughs> Again, there's also this very, very prevalent. Uh, people uh, conjure up the image of uh, someone who, uh, a strong woman, but someone who disregards all, all forms of uh, 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 institutions, uh, uh, a rebel, basically. All right, so <laughs> it's there too. And uh, they, uh, some say also that feminists want it easy, that they want to uh, have the best of both worlds, that they want reservations, but uh, they want uh, uh, to be taken care of at the same time. No, again, that is not true, right? So male feminists are, again, another misconception. Male feminists are men against their own gender. No. Men who believe in the equality of everyone are just feminists. Now, in being uh, being feminists, they are actually what they are actually doing is they are also doing themselves uh, some good because we are helping each other. In fact, male feminists are bringing down stereotypes against men too. I'm quoting from that article: making life much easier for their fellow men. All right. So uh, in a way, uh, uh, I'm just trying to show the positive, uh, what it is to uh, our students here. Feminists cannot be stereotypically feminine. You've talked about this again. Well, uh, if a woman by choice wants to be feminine, that's her choice. It all boils down to choice. When something is uh, imposed, then that is where the problem lies. If it is by choice, then of course you can be as feminine as you like. And feminists don't believe in marriages. Again, this is a misconception. Now, I know a lot of women who have uh, this, uh, decided not to get married, a lot of feminists, but I don't think uh, they have uh, decided not to get married just because they are feminists or because they hate marriages. It is because of the inequalities that exist within the marriage institution. And it is the rejection of that inequality again. It is all about equality. And also, all feminists are career oriented. This is another misconception. You can be a housewife and still be a feminist, right? And so I'm bringing all these up here uh, for our MISO students, basically, just to uh, uh, help them understand what it actually is and why we need to bring it into literary theory as well. Because uh, now uh, we need to to get, get behind all our assumptions and start asking questions in order to address the real issues. Now, I, uh, I have taken up so much time already. So uh, uh, now, just to general ideas, uh, talking about all these things. Now, let me get to the Mizo literature a bit here. Now, because of the paucity of time, I will not be able to talk more about it, but, uh, I know it would be really interesting to talk about Mizo literature as a whole and also about Mizo women writers, but then we don't have the time for that. So let me just highlight some of the questions that need to be asked of some of our maybe folk tales, uh, especially the ones that our audiences are more familiar with. For example, uh, uh, we have the case of Twelve Wee. Now, uh, and if we dig into our history or to our literature, there are uh, empowered women here and there, but I have to give credit to 
my colleagues, Jamie, Kuku, and Dini here for, uh, for bringing up this point. The fact that we have to dig deep into our folk tales and in, into our history to find empowered women in itself says a lot about uh, how much or how little they are getting uh, attention, how little they are featured. And uh, now, uh, there is the, uh, the question of uh, Twal Vungi, who has married uh, some, uh, who was married to Zolpala. It's a love story. But then uh, what happens is there is the uh, a wizard Puntia, uh, the villain who thought, uh, uh, who wanted to marry Twal Vungi, and uh, Zolpala did uh, did not have the guts to stand in the way, so he let her go and she married him. Now, after a while, what happened was Zolpala was dying because he was uh, missing his wife so much. And uh, Twalungi was let known about his condition. And now for the first time, Twalungi, in defiance of her now current husband, decides to go to Zolpala anyway. Now, that is uh, an instance of where we get a woman uh, standing up against her husband to do what she wants to do. But again, like we've said, uh, having to dig deep into that itself says a lot about what we feel about uh, uh, women and what they are supposed to do and how they are supposed to obediently follow men's will. And also, in uh, she is portrayed as the idealized, self-sacrificing woman. Even if she had a choice, about leaving her husband Zolpala for uh, Puntia, she, she still decided to go to save Zolpala. So she is portrayed as that person who has just uh, sacrificed herself for her husband, the dutiful wife again. So we don't have that many uh, assertive women uh, in our stories. And uh, now there's another story called, uh, called Mauruangi again. Uh, here we have a case of her being what uh, Miss Kritika said, uh, women being rewarded with marriage and the bad girl being uh, killed off by death, punished by death. Uh, now the fact that they had to fight at the end for the husband and also how marriage to a man is projected as the only way they could gain uh, happiness. Now we have all these things uh, in our stories. So I'm just bringing these up just to uh, help our students get a general idea of how it is. Now, uh, uh, in your culture, Ms. Kritika, what I want to ask is, uh, do you have stories about the stereotypical evil stepmother, the scheming evil stepmother? Like uh, the stronger women are usually portrayed in our uh, stories as uh, these kind of uh, stereotypical stepmothers. So do you have those uh, uh, kinds as well? And how is, uh, is that so far uh, different from how it is in your society? Uh, absolutely, we do too. So my, uh, I'll be honest, I'm not uh, very well versed in, I'm Punjabi. So I'm not All very right. well versed in let's say Punjabi folklore. But uh, I grew up listening to stories that my grandmother told me. And most of those stories, yes, so we have, uh, I don't remember the name of the story, but I still remember that it's about two sisters who are ill-treated by their stepmother. And then they sort of turn into trees because that's the only safe place that they have. But yeah, we, we, we always have had that. We have, uh, and again, most English fairy tales that I grew up reading, you always have the evil stepmother who we can also make the argument that who she is the empowered woman in that story, but she's presented as a villain. And uh, we, in for example, in Disney or Disney movies have started to change that. So you have movies like Maleficent, where the stepmother is the heroine. The stepmother turns out to be the actually the good woman. But yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree. And the, I was sort of unsurprised at how similar uh, the stories that I grew up reading were then with the stories that you just sort of explained. We always have had that dichotomy between the good woman and the, I mean, that's how you teach girls how to be good. Right? That's how these are, these are all stories for socialization. So yeah, no, absolutely. 
I can I also quickly just uh, talk about a couple of other things that you said, and I'm mostly going to agree. Uh, your uh, identi identification with equalism, for example, same. I when I was in college, I and I I think things have changed now. We do get students who are much more politically aware, but at my time, and that this was more than a decade ago when I was in college. I used to run away from the word feminism because it was such a maligned word. Like nobody would want to identify as a feminist because you would be thought of everything that you listed. You you are stuck up. You are probably a lesbian. You are you hate men, etc. So I remember I remember also falling into all of this. Why not call it humanism? I'm an equalist and I'm not a feminist. But as we grow up and as we also sort of see the material material reality of being adult women uh, in society and in working spaces especially um, you sort of start you start start seeing the importance of feminism so i i mean some of it comes with age some of it comes with political awareness but uh, but yeah i mean i had pretty much the same trajectory i also want to agree with uh, what feminism does for men uh, and I, I think that isn't said enough, especially in our cultures, that feminism helps men too, right? That we, if we have patriarchy that wants to slot women into particular roles, it slots men into particular roles as well. So men have to be the breadwinners and men can't cry and they have to be stronger and they have to open doors. And what you said, to say that Feminists want everything, they want rights and uh, reservation, but they also want to be taken care of. I would also suggest that that's, that's, that should be a universal thing. Men also want to be taken care of, who doesn't want to be taken care of. But somehow we only say this about women, right? because we have, we have somehow created a system where men are supposed to be the caretakers and women are supposed to be the fragile ones who, who men take care of. So I one last thing. The, the importance of feminism, and especially what you said right in the beginning, the fact that in feminist theory, especially we have, we have in any theory, we have too much jargon. So if I talk to my mother about feminism, I can say compulsory heterosexuality or phallogocentrism, and it's not going to mean anything to her. It's definitely not going to mean anything to, uh, let's say I'm, I'm working with, a, with, with women um, so I right now I'm kind of in my ancestral house. We have our, our villages right next to this town. And I mean, women who farm for a living, women who work in villages for a living, Judith Butler is not going to mean anything to them. So I, and I think that's the task that literary, that feminist theory, feminist criticism should do, that we should, and let's just call it cultural criticism from a feminist point of view that we need to bridge that gap between everyday realities of women and different realities for different women and all of these concepts that we learn in class and in English honors and then we feel so intellectual after learning them and I agree with you that's that's the that theory needs to be I brought down that's that's a slightly charged phrase but it brought to the level of everyday people uh, everyday people living their everyday daily lives. So I agree with you there as well. Can I just intervene with a question? Uh, both of you may address this. Considering our cultural differences, how relevant is a Western-based feminist theory on Indian literature written by and about Indian women? Isn't it time that we have a literary theory of our own? So that is the question. I hope it is clear. Um, both of you may address uh, this question. Can I just quickly? Uh, absolutely, 100%. That's actually one of the disclaimers that I forgot to give for my paper. Uh, we, we don't, for example, I, academically, I have never studied Indian feminist theory, right, from, from whatever part of India, from whatever culture. And I do think that's a major lack, that's a major gap in our uh, study of literature. Of course, there is. You have you have especially coming from sociology, you have people like Nivedita Menon, you have Kamla Bhaseen, you have uh, Shilpa Fatke. Not to say, for example, the authors that you named that I'm not even familiar with, but authors from different cultures, authors not doing theory, but writing literature. And I'm not equipped to do that. I wish I was. 
but absolutely we i don't think we we can abs- define our lives absolutely through western theories and western concepts yeah they give us important tools that we can use and maybe appropriate and work with but uh, uh, a sense of an indian literary theory and again i am saying indian with the absolute awareness that there is no such thing as indian right there can only be indian theories not one indian theory but uh, yeah we absolutely need that and so I, I i totally agree with kritika we need indian theories and even with uh, in the mizo context also i i think i i, I absolutely believe we need to come up with some mizo literary uh, feminism right now uh, the, uh, the people in theology uh, feminist in theology have uh, done a lot of work in uh, feminism but their take is based on theology alone right now uh, the thing is we uh, we actually need to uh, something tailored to our miso society and which will also take into account the fact that religion plays a very very big role in our lives we have a uh, religion uh, the christian religion which is very patriarchal in itself has played a big role in conditioning us into believing a lot of things we believe in uh, so many of our assumptions are based on that too and uh, some of the assumptions that may have may have already been there are actually reinforced by our christian beliefs too so uh, some we actually need something tailored to our own needs our own specific needs i i i believe that thank you Okay, since it's almost four thirty, and since we still have another session tomorrow, um, I would just like to um, read this out. Read this out, as in, uh, for us to ponder on. And uh, I would also like to invite Dr. Christina and even Dr. Sanga if they would like to contribute their ideas. So maybe this can be the last point that you know we can discuss, and after that we we will close our session for today. Um, we know that feminist theory has been around for years and uh, both of you have already addressed how you know we still have to answer basic awkward questions about feminism till today and uh, miss nuboy have also pointed out many uh, you know uh, many perceived notions about feminism as well about feminist theory um on the other hand you know to ponder on how many uh, feminists uh, project have projected or pushed their agenda openly uh, for example if we look at uh, you know hollywood um, there are female cele- celebrities who would openly or consciously not shave and you know would flaunt that on the red carpet and like for example if we think about the free nipple movement uh, i think we we have all heard of it uh, free nipple movement a movement that promotes you know freedom for women to be able to make their own decision uh, now the the point is how do we approach it from a conservative society like ours or you know from a religious perspective like if we call ourselves uh, feminists do we necessarily have to agree with those kind of movement or uh, do we approach it differently based on our uh, you know um, society or our belief uh, so that's the point that i would just like to raise and uh, we can discuss a little bit about it and uh, maybe uh, end it after our discussion um okay so i would again i would suggest that we cannot obviously agree with or we don't have to agree with all kinds of political acts even within a movement that we agree with so i understand that i mean we might have religious or political objections to something like free the nipple movement but i also totally think that uh, often radical action is required to bring a bring a point to public consciousness and that doesn't necessarily so in the 1960s feminists would burn bras and uh, they would they they did stop wearing uh, they would very actively stop wearing bras for example uh, and this is not i i'm not calling it a feminist uh, a feminist act but we have we still all indians have seen that famous image from the the protests against afspa in manipur uh, against uh, the women uh, on behalf of the women who had been raped by the army and you have all of these naked women holding a banner 
I mean, you can make the argument, why don't, why do they have to be naked, right? Except that that's, that's exactly the site of the struggle. It's the female body. And I think something like Free the Nipple, I'm not saying that it's a movement that I would necessarily want to participate in myself. But I think as, a, as something that points out the hypocrisy in how men can go about in their public lives shirtless and how women can go about in their public lives, I think that's also necessary. So we, we do, uh, we all make individual choices. Right? And that's something that you had pointed out. But I think, and we all, we all make our own calculations and we all decide how much of a protest we are in for. But I think that it's, it's important to also see these as, again, political acts. And I agree, often a lot of, especially in, in celebrity culture, a lot of these just become publicity stunts. I'm not, I'm not, any, not in favor of celebrity culture at all. But if, those, if they are pointing out some important uh, social issues or cultural issues that can that they can bring into public consciousness, then why not? So yeah, I mean, I, I understand that that's not an exact answer, but that's the answer that I have. Thank you, Ms. Nupui. I totally agree. Uh, I, I don't. I'm not meaning that we should do uh, the same thing that they have done, but sometimes you need to take uh, rather drastic actions to bring uh, attention to the. Uh, the issue on had. Uh, however, uh, of course, I was grinning year to year because I was picturing myself doing the same thing and whether I, I, I would be able to do it in public or not. Now, again, uh, it all comes down to our culture and where, uh, where we are. Now, some, uh, of course, we may have something drastic to bring attention to some very pressing issues, depending on what it is and all, but maybe not exactly in the same way because uh, that same thing might not have the actual same impact it had on the people, the Western people, or uh, in the case of uh, the, the, uh, the Manipur women, what they did was related to the women's body, right? Women being raped, uh, the atrocities of the army. So uh, it, was, it was very, very powerful then because it was about uh, how the uh, men had been uh, viewing the women, how women had always been the victim of conflicts, right? Uh, so uh, it was very relevant then. If given the chance, we may, uh, like, if such a situation arises, we may have to do that, but not exactly in the same way. Uh, I believe all these things actually are part of uh, moving forward, yeah. basically. And I, I would like to hear Ms. Christina's view on this. Yes, uh, Dr. Christina, are you there? Yes, yes, I'm here. <clears throat> I'm not going to switch on my uh, video because I'm in the kitchen and I'm actually doing a motherly job of trying to cook for the family, all right? <laughs> okay. Uh, and also my, my internet is doing funny things, so I, I may sound a little bit weird. And if I go silent, then just assume the internet is a bit weird, all right? So... Uh, just directly answering to uh, Nalrimthani's question. Very, very specifically in our Mizo culture, right? I can say for sure that it is important that a lot of the discussions we have in these seminars don't get stuck in the circle, but then it actually transfers out into the, you know, the, the, the social fabric of society, right? That people need to hear these things. Now, many people will not understand Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, you are audible. Yeah, uh, many people will not understand the English language, first of all, right? Especially that of our uh, theoretical jargon, right? So I think that we need to articulate all of these feminist ideas and you know our suggestions and our goodwill into the Mizo language. Now, when I say translate, it could be in the form of books, to go out in the public, men could read it, women could read it, colleges could read it, anybody could read it. And another good way to actually help people understand what feminism is, help break down stereotypes, um, you know, make it useful in our day-to-day -day lives would also be about talk talking about it, having conversations about it. You know, your college could have talk shows about it. These kinds of uh, content is absolutely wanting and there's a huge vacuum for it and there's a huge need for it so we just need to fill those pockets so that 
the more people actually hear about it, what we are doing is that we are educating them regarding it. And we should not be afraid of men actually, uh, or men or even women, because these are women ourselves, we are very, very patriarchal, isn't it? Many, many MHEP people may not even agree with us because even they are a very patriarchal group. So, but the point is to actually have conversations about it, to welcome their feedback, to even take them on in certain conditions, be very respectful to their argument. But the point is that, uh, you know, it needs to be transferred out. And I think that the, with regards to, uh, you know, us being such a conservative kind of uh, society, there is also a great need or even a desire from the younger generation to have these kinds of talks because the younger generation, whether it is, you know, the millennial downwards to Gen Z, all of them actually are quite open-minded. They're quite uh, receptive to these ideas. But like I said, uh, students who belong to the English department may be exposed to it, but what, are, what about the other departments, whether it is in the college or whether it is in the university, do their teachers even talk about it, right? So uh, I would suggest those as practical ways of approaching it with regards to the conservative uh, societies. You do not have to remove your bra, you do not have to do all that. If people are uh, going to do that, it's absolutely fine. You know, we should take it as a powerful image, just like Nuboyi talked about, you know, the, the Manipuri context, isn't it? We also, you know, we can take those um, images as something very powerful and jarring so that it will grab eyeballs in a way, but people should understand the arguments behind that. So that, that would be my answer. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Christina, for your contribution. Um, sadly, we have to end our session with that. Um, I would now call upon Ms. Lelma Somi from the Department of English, uh, Government Sethip College, to give the vote of thanks. Hello, am I audible? Yes. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lama Somi, Assistant Professor, Department of English. I feel extremely privileged to be able to present a vote of thanks for today's webinar. So on behalf of the Department of English and the Women's Cell Government Sertip College, I would like to express our sincere gratitude to our esteemed speaker, Ms. Kritika Sharma for her generosity in sharing and enlightening us with her vast knowledge on feminism and literary theory and broadens our views. We believe that all of us will be benefited greatly from her talk. We also extend our deep sense of appreciation to Ms. V. Lama Somi for her far further analysis and insight on the topic in relation to our own Mizo society. Thank you so much to both of you for gracing us and making our webinar a success. Today is indeed a very special session. We are greatly indebted and we are most fortunate to have the opportunity to enjoy your highly skilled knowledge. Finally, we extend our appreciation to our participants for your valuable time attention, positive feedbacks, and for actively getting involved through your questions. As today is the second day of our uh, three days national webinar series, we once again earnestly invite everyone to stay with us and continue to grace us on the third day of our webinar series. Tomorrow's session will start at 2 p.m. in the afternoon. We hope to see everyone again. We wish you to have a very good evening. Thank you and stay blessed. Okay, thank you everyone. Thank you so much, Ms. Nguyen and Kritika. Thank you. Um, thank you. Please